Pawn to e4, pawn to e5, knight f3, and knight to c6. And it's from this position that today I'd like us to look at some minute differences between the Rey Lopez, which would be the move bishop to b5, and the Italian game, which would be the move bishop to c4. Now, both moves look equally good in this position, so it might be surprising to find out that modern grandmasters, the top players in the world, largely prefer the Rey Lopez. In fact, they're about 10 times more likely to play bishop b5 in this position rather than bishop c4. And so by drawing your attention to some of the minute differences between these two systems, I hope to enrich your understanding of both the Rey Lopez and the Italian game. Here we have the key position where white is able to choose between deploying the bishop on b5 and deploying the bishop on c4. And it appears that both moves have their advantages. On c4, the bishop has the most scope and also maybe targets this f7 point, which could become key later in the tactical phase. Whereas with bishop b5, white starts some additional pressure on this e5 pawn. Both moves also prepare white to castle quickly. But as we'll see in just a moment, there are a lot of other fascinating things going on in this position. Both sides face a similar situation in the center since the center is symmetrical. Pawn on e4 and pawn on e5. But White's counting on two important little trumps here. First of all, he still retains the right to move, and this means that his operations will come in just a little bit more quickly. But secondly, and just as importantly, White has managed to force Black to play knight to c6 in this position. And it's due to this tiniest of details that White gets an idea. His idea is to play pawn to c3 and pawn to d4, attacking the e5 pawn and building up a bigger share of the center, and he's exploiting the fact that black has blocked his own c-pawn and cannot play the same build-up plan in the center. So, to make this plan work, white has to be sure that he doesn't fall under the same problem covering his own e-pawn. For example, in light of the discussion we just had, you might suppose that white should just play pawn to c3 in this position. But in fact, this move has two major drawbacks. First of all, the move is so slow that black can just play d5 himself, and he can achieve an equal game right off the bat since he immediately achieves this all-important thrust of the d-pawn, and he doesn't have to worry about losing time with the queen after, say, pawn takes pawn and queen takes pawn, since the knight is currently deprived of the c3 square. This is one reason that c3 is not a great idea in this position. A second antidote which is also very successful, and which is a little bit more uh, a little bit more instructive in this position is knight to f6, and this is normally what white needs to fear. Black also can attack the e-pawn, and here it's kind of difficult to find a good way to defend this pawn without surrendering the plan of d2 to d4. For example, if white plays the, pawn, the move pawn to d3, well, of course, this pawn is now no longer eligible to come to d4 for quite some time. The same is true if white plays the awkward move bishop to d3 when, of course, again, the pawn is weirdly situated here. Another move which white might try is queen c2, but in this case, I think that white is just losing time. Black's move knight to f6 will be immensely more useful than white's move queen to c2, since we're not really interested in developing the queen so early, and probably just the move d5 leads to a perfectly adequate game for black. So, it's due to all these things, in fact, that white's normally goes ahead and enters complications with the move pawn to d4, as anything else gives black a very satisfactory game. But here too, it's been well known for a while that after knight takes pawn on e4, black still achieves a satisfactory game, uh, since, for example, after the move pawn takes pawn on e5, black is still able to bring this pawn up to d5, and black has already achieved a rather comfortable game. So, even though white in this position has successfully found the right idea of playing c2 to c3 and d2 to d4, he still needs to take appropriate details into account, and he needs to devise a strategy and make arrangements for how he's going to deal with black getting ready to attack white's pawn on e4. So whatever white does next, he needs to keep this, this factor in mind while he continues to play for the correct plan. So with the move bishop to c4, in addition to the other attractive points, putting the bishop on a nice square and observing f7 and also preparing to castle kingside, in addition to these points, 
White is also ready to play pawn to d3 at a moment's notice if he needs to defend the e4 pawn. And in this case, now he already has the bishop outside of the pawn chain, and later he's going to make efforts to bring further defense to the e4 pawn, probably by castling, playing moves like rook e1, and then the knight to bdd2. And then later he'll play for c3 and d4. And this is one of the points of bishop c4, is that it helps to facilitate white's playing d2 to d3 in order to defend the e4 pawn. In fact, the best players in the world have tended to handle the Italian game using this sort of slow build-up idea. For example, after knight f6, players on the white side have come to prefer the very quiet move, simple pawn to d3. And now white will play in a very gradual style similar to the Ray Lopez. In fact, let's just imagine that white gets a bunch of moves here in order to show some of their key ideas. Black would white would ordinarily continue with c2 to c3, castles kingside, bishop b3, and then moves like Let's say rook e1, knight bd d2. Notice how we're defending this pawn adequately, and we're also using a very typical maneuver of the knight to f1 and to g3. And then usually around here does white finally make a choice about when and whether to play pawn to d4. And this is a very typical plan. For example, let's just give black some moves now and show how this play typically pans out. After knight f6, many games have continued d3, bishop e7, castles kingside, castles kingside, and bishop e3. Now I want to point out that the idea of this move bishop b3 is to save this bishop from an eventual stab by the knight knight a5. And at the moment, black is not quite yet ready to play knight a5 because he has to watch this pawn on e5. So first he plays d6, but now white is just in time with the move c3, ready to give this bishop an attractive square on c2. In fact, black still continues with the move knight to a5, bishop c2, and c5, this is the key idea, bringing that c-pawn into the game and helping to control the center. Rook e1, the knight comes back to the more sensible c6 square, and now knight bd2, and play tends to go rook e8, h3, bishop f8, knight f1. Very standard setup for white. In fact, we see this exact same sort of setup for white many, many times in the Ray Lopez. To show a comparison, let's look at one of the most traditional lines in the Ray Lopez and show just how similar play is from White's point of view. Instead of this move, bishop c4, the Ray Lopez of course continues bishop b5, and now play often continues for the main lines a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castle and kingside, bishop e7, rook e1, b5, bishop to b3, d6. Once again, he's defending this pawn, so we now know what we have to do. We have to make sure that we've made arrangements for this bishop to reach c2, so white plays c3, and that's also in accordance with his plan. And now, castles kingside, h3 is the known move here, knight a5, bishop c2, c5, very, very similar play even by black. And now white plays d4, and in the Jagoran variation, which this is from the Ray Lopez, black normally plays queen c7, knight bd d2, and we're setting up for very, very similar play. So this is very, very similar, no matter whether we play the Ray Lopez or the Italian game, it looks like these positions are more or less very equivalent, and white is doing very similar things, and black is doing very similar things. So it's up to us to try to figure out what is it about this position, which we're looking at now, that white players find so much more attractive than the Italian game versions, which we just saw a moment ago. What is the difference in this position? Why is it that world champions and grandmasters have been willing to play the Ruy Lopez version of these positions, whereas mostly players at the club level are willing to play the Italian game? Well, let's back up just a moment to this position right before d2 to d4, and I want you to notice something very subtle. That in this position, white is able to play the move pawn to d4 all in one go. And by that I mean, in the Italian game, he typically had wasted a tempo playing d2 to d3 very early on in the game, so that when this pawn came to d4, it was only with a loss of tempo. And for example, normally that would mean that Black's knight would already have had time to retreat successfully to the c6 square, and this little difference is one of the major reasons why white has a little bit less of advantage in the Ray Lopez
than in the Italian game. Let's take a look at that a little bit more closely. Let's slowly review the Italian game version again. White played bishop c4, knight f6, and now pawn to d3, little difference. Bishop to e7, castles kingside, castles kingside, and we showed the move bishop to b3, pawn to d6, c3, knight to a5, bishop to c2, and pawn to c5. And now, white typically continued rook to e1, knight to c6. Notice that this is a, a big difference, that black's knight has already come back to this c6 square. And now knight to bdd2, and we have rook e8, h3, all very same for white, but there are some big differences with black setup. But the main difference which I want us to focus on for today, after bishop f8, knight f1, h6, and now, for example, pawn to d4, the big difference that I want us to focus on is that white has lost a tempo with this maneuver, d3 very early, d3 occurred on move 4, and on move 13, we're moving that pawn a second time, where in the Rio Lopez, we did not have to do that. There are some other differences, but the major way that black has profited from this tempo is that his knight is already on a much better location, and often this gives black an option, for example, to trade material on d4 and achieve a, a pretty natural game here. There are actually a few differences we can discuss between these very similar versions of the same position. However, I just want to focus right now on how exactly white lost a tempo in the Italian game. And to see this more clearly, let's start looking again at the move bishop b5, which was the Rui Lopez. Now, one of the little secrets in the Rui Lopez is that white has in fact devised a solution to the defense of his e4 pawn. Remember that early on in this video we spent a long time discussing the fact that white needs to make some preparations to defend the e4 pawn. It turns out that in the Royal Lopez, white has an option to temporarily ignore the threat to e4. For example, after the move knight f6, or after the move a6, which is a little bit more common, bishop a4, and now knight f6, instead of playing d2 to d3, as white played in the Italian game, white actually has the move castling kingside in this position. And in both cases, if black does in fact take on e4, and I want to point out really quick that quite often black does not take on e4, and instead he plays bishop e7, and now white uses his rook to defend the e4 pawn, and the problem is solved. But if black takes on e4, white has access to the move pawn to d4, and a lot of theory has been written about these positions, but it's well known that white has excellent chances of an advantage in this kind of position. So why can't white use the same exact idea in the Italian game? Well, it turns out that after bishop to c4, after knight f6, the move castling kingside is just a very weak move. Since after knight takes e4, the big problem is that black is going to be able to play d5 next move with tempo. And he will do this no matter whether white plays rook e1 or if he plays pawn to d4. Now black would simply play pawn to d5 with tempo against the bishop on c4. And it's because of this tiny little factor that the bishop's placement on d4 actually turns out to be a slight disadvantage for white. If the bishop is on b5, he never has to fear this kind of possibility and would simply play something like knight takes e5. But on c4, black's threat on e4 to take on e4 with the knight is slightly stronger because he can always follow up with d5 with tempo. And it's this little detail that means that white needs to go out of his way to defend the pawn on e4, usually with the move pawn to d3. And so as we've seen before, in the Rey Lopez, after bishop to b5, a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castles, indeed, black most often does not take on e4, and instead simply plays bishop e7, and this gives white the opportunity to play rook e1. Problem solved. As we've seen, white is now in an excellent position to play his plan c2 to c3 and pawn to d4, and by using the rook, to defend the e4 pawn, he's avoided the time-wasting move with d2 to d3. And now that you've seen all this, you now understand one of the key strategic benefits of the Rui Lopez over the Italian game. In the Rui Lopez, white is able to deal with the threat to e4 more effectively, since for a single tempo, 
he can afford not to defend the e4 pawn. And it's this little difference which makes White's attempts to gain the advantage in the Ruy Lopez more persuasive than his attempts to gain an advantage in the Italian game.